All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. I'm going to do that intro again for the conversation with Eric Dale in this episode. And I'm asking Eric in the beginning if he can promote his upcoming Bitcoin art meetup in Berlin. So he's going to do that. That's a bit informative, but I want, you, want to ask you to stick with it because after that, it's going to be a very exploring conversation that goes in many different ways. And I absolutely loved it. And I loved it so much that I thought I'm going to do a double intro. So please get through the first minutes, listen to what he's organizing, and then we're going to dive deep really fast. Cheers. All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Eric Dill. He's a European revivalist and prolific Bitcoiner, host of the Bitcoin for Breakfast podcast and organizer of the Northern Lighting Bitcoin conference in Scandinavia and also of an epic upcoming meetup in Berlin. He's an expert communications professional and was a former advisor to the president of the European Commission. He has a unique perspective on how Bitcoin must save the old world and shares a lot about his experience of how Bitcoin and LSD and parenthood changed his life. So uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you so much, Bram. Really looking forward to this. Yeah, me too, man. We finally made it. Uh, we, we tried uh, two or three times, I think, but, uh, but now we're here. So I'm happy too. I, uh, I, uh, yesterday when we tried, but <laughs> now we're doing it, I shared, I really enjoyed your, uh, your conversation with, uh, with Breed Love. Like I especially love, you know, the philosophical dimension of Bitcoin. So we're definitely going to talk about that. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that conversation because, um, th I think the title was language psychedelics in Bitcoin or something like this. Yeah, and and these were th these were thoughts that me and Breedlove had just uh, hammered out over drinks the night before. Never really ventured into that side of philosophy, but it was really such a great conversation to play back oh, really? and forth. Yeah, so yeah, really enjoyed that. Cool that you cool that you caught it. I I think this is what Bitcoin does in general, don't you think? Like you yeah. are like like Bitcoiners are curious people, and so I think if you just pull on a certain thread, you can just dive into it without, I don't know, maybe without any goal. Right. Yeah. It's just for the purpose of just to be on the front lines of reality. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a good one. I'm gonna keep <laughs> that in mind. Well, before we start, I first want you to really like plug your Berlin meetup. You told me about the concept, which I absolutely loved, and I also think there's an element there, um, you know, for other people to collaborate with you to have other meetups in other cities. So I'll, I'll first let you do that. So please, please go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I call it a meetup. We call it the Bitcoin meetup instead of a meetup. But in reality, that is just to indicate that this is a free open uh, event in the style of meetup. That's how most Bitcoiners met their first Bitcoiners. That's how we started out this movement. That's how we built our community. Meetups, free open events. And in this world of commercial corporate conferences popping up everywhere, I think it's really important to have one major free open event in the spirit of Bitcoin, in the spirit of open source, and in the spirit of the meetups. So that's what we're trying to create uh, uh, here. And, and the focus is on, on art and culture. Europe is losing its position as a financial superpower. And it's never going to be a military superpower again, for obvious reasons. But we can and we will remain a cultural superpower if we choose to build a culture around Bitcoin. And for me, Berlin is a really, really cool place that brings these things together. Obviously, Berlin itself has always been on the front lines of many things, whether it's the Cold War or uh, the World War II or, or, or reality itself. Street art uh, has perhaps its most iconic home here in Berlin, definitely the most iconic canvas with the wall. And Bitcoin, of course, uh, is um, cypherpunk. It is, uh, in many ways, the digital version of, of street art, I would say. And therefore, we want to create an event that brings these things together under this notion of a free open event accessible to everyone. So you don't have to be a dev, you don't have to be a tech. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to do a three day street art race with Bitcoin art across 21 famous landmarks in Berlin. Each participant will be given a tote bag with spray paint, stencils and stickers, some Bitcoin oriented, some from the companies that sponsor the event and so on. But they will be encouraged to go to these 21 landmarks over three days, decorate uh, some of the items that we have listed as acceptable to decorate on, post pictures of this on social media. And if you collect all 21 landmarks, you win original artwork by local artists, in this case, Berlin artists. Uh, this is an amazing way to bring 
families and friends and no coiners along. You can take a tour of, with them, do some sightseeing in the city. It's in the middle of the day in the sun in June. It's a great way to just be in a new city and see a new city while you leave a mark for Bitcoin. Um, and it's a great way to connect the cities with Bitcoin in the public eye, because you will be flooded with great photos of landmarks with Bitcoin logos and Bitcoin messages everywhere. And finally, these landmarks are visited by millions of people every single year. Uh, there should always be exposure to Bitcoin as a phenomenon, as a brand, as a message to every one of these landmarks, which will have a long lasting effect long, long after the event is over. So yeah, a free open event focused on art and culture where all the participants will be given an opportunity to leave their mark for Bitcoin in some of the most famous sites in the world. And if this concept works, which I think it will, uh, then we can export this to other cities in Europe. And just imagine, dream with me for a moment about a Europe where you can't go to any landmark because the Bitcoin gorilla has already been there. It's been branded <laughs> everywhere. And yeah, uh, yeah um, I think this is a, a Europe I think would be really cool to, to, to live in. Plus uh, the culture that we can build around Bitcoin while doing this, I think is, is uh, uh, really where Europe can have its strength in the future, not trying yeah. to be a financial or military superpower. Love that, man. And I think, uh, well, if, if people are around Berlin or want to come to Berlin, when is it? It's from the 6th to the 9th of June. Kickoff is on the 6th. We start the race on the 7th to the 9th. If you can only make it on the 8th, don't worry. The maps that we give out on the 7th will be equally valid the next day. So you can join the race as it goes along, but you have to stay until the end to have the chance to win. So 6th to the 9th of June in Berlin. If you're going to Oslo Freedom Forum or if you're going to BTC Prague, this is on the weekend in between these conferences. So we are welcoming already a lot of the international Bitcoiners who are traveling to Europe for those conferences. We are welcoming a lot of European Bitcoiners who organize meetups across the continent. And of course, the entire Berlin community is just so excited to, to welcome all these Bitcoiners to our city. So uh, that's, well, who that's, that's who, we're, who we are uh, targeting this to. And where can people find um, more info? Well, honestly, the easiest thing is to go to my Twitter profile, Eurodale. On Eurodale, okay. you will find all the different links, including the website, which I would have read out loud, but frankly, it's easier to read the link than to, to spell okay, it out. Awesome. Well, you I'm will... linking to your, your profile in the, in the description. Thank so, you. Uh, there's also a link to Telegram will... there, and there's a link to RSVP in Meetup. Now, because it's free and open, it means you don't actually have to sign up. Nobody is forced to sign up. You don't have to register anywhere. You can show up. Um, but we will only prepare tote bags with spray paint and stencils and so on for the people who have registered. So if you want yep. to participate in the race and want your materials, please do sign up on Meetup. It's also super, super helpful for us organizers. Well, now we have that out of the way. Let's, uh, let's dive in. I, uh, in my intro, I, uh, I used the word European revivalist. I think mm. that's how you dub yourself. How do we revive Europe and where do we end up if we succeed? Well, I mentioned it a little bit actually in my pitch right now for, for this event in Berlin, that Europe's time as a financial superpower is coming to an end. Europe's role as a military superpower, as long as we exist in the shadow of the US, uh, we will uh, rem not have a future in that space. Um, what we can have a future in is to be a cultural leader in the world. That's what we have been for 500 years. And I think that's where Europe really has its bright future um, uh, too. Um, how do we revive Europe? I mean, it depends a little bit what you think the disease is, right? Uh, we are a continent <laughs> yeah. that is deeply overregulated. We are a continent that looks more to the past than to the future. Um, we are a continent where very few citizens have reasons for entrepreneurship or for creation or, or, uh, or even staying here. If you are, if you are successful, look at the Max Kaiser, Stacey Herbert example, you, you rather want to leave to El Salvador and stay there. Mm. Um, the question of how to do it is a really like, I don't know in a way, but what I really want us to do is to create a mindset where it's something that we want to do. A lot of people are thinking about their plan B's, about getting to El Salvador or whatever. And uh, I just don't want that to become the plan A for everybody because I really love this continent. I'm so proud. It's maybe the most beautiful continent humans have ever created. And I'm so proud of it. And I, over my dead body, will I leave it behind for EU bureaucrats and warmongers to feast on? Um, this is my continent. 
And I think that Bitcoiners should have the mindset that there is a Bitcoin future here on this continent. Um, and to find that our strength is not to try to be the next El Salvador, it's not going to happen. Our strength is not to try to be uh, to, to beat Russia's military capacities, uh, but our strength is to be a leading light in the world that people look up to and, and emulate and learn from. Um, and that's where the cultural revival comes in for me. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, I think I feel the same. To be honest, I'm not really super deep into like the state of Europe. I think it's from a distance. Of course, I live here too, but it's kind of like I, I, I do see, I, I definitely don't like the technocratic bureaucracy. I don't like the warmongering. I think, you know, for a continent that looks to its past, I find it not, uh, I find it very paradoxical that this is how they talk right now. So I, I think that's scary in a way. You know, I, I, I don't feel the unity right, <laughs> right now. And I think that is also something that is in general, honestly, you know, hard to create in Europe. Right, I think that the Dutch people are not the Spaniards, and the Spaniards are not the Hungarians, etc. But uh, the the idea of a collaborative union across a space like this is obviously something that is worthwhile to pursue. I think. But it's well, I also about... think that we have to acknowledge that European identity has become much stronger over the last thirty to fifty years. And when I started out thinking about these things twenty years ago. Um, the notion of a European identity of, of a sort of united Europe was still pretty strong as a dream, but very weak among people. But the realities of our shared experience, I think, over the last 20, 30 years especially, has created a, a, um, a notion of a shared space that can no longer be ignored. So when we think about what comes after the EU and so on, we can't just think back to the past and look to um, a world where we are just our segregated national communities that work together in bilateral agreements and so on. Uh, the truth is Europeans have become Europeans on some level. And um, whatever comes next needs to have that unifying element. And there I think Bitcoin is a great neutral open platform that all the Europeans can share uh, without yeah. necessarily needing big heavy institutions in Brussels, right? Yeah, I, f I, f I fully agree. But then I would pose the question, you know, what brings us together in Bitcoin? I think the, the, the entire point of Bitcoin is that it's vol uh, voluntary, right? And that yeah. each, and us, each one of us chooses to participate in this and that we start to play a, a mutually beneficial game. Or, or participate in a mutually beneficial system and like what you just said about europe like i I, do, I don't have that experience like i for me it's always felt like it's forced it's not organic um i i cannot really say like like point to any things but but i mean yeah that's kind of how it felt like okay europe is europe or something um well, and, and yeah just uh like for like, I think there's beauty. I, I thought I would never say this sentence actually, but the beauty and the diversity of the countries I like, you know, and and like putting that all in one pot and saying like, oh, you're all European, like that's what I mean. Like like Dutch are not Spaniards and Spaniards are not Hungarians. Like that forcing into this yeah. one thing. I I don't know. Like that kind of yeah. I don't I don't think I don't you think about it as forcing against... into one thing. You think about it as multi level governance. Right. In the same way as you have a local identity in your town and your region, but you also have a national identity you belong to. And you have different governance levels that are appropriate to, to diff well, you're supposed to at least. I'm not sure if they always live up to this ideal, but in theory, you know, decisions should be made as close as possible to the citizen. Things that can be kept local in your city are kept local in the city. And the parliament only deals with, with things that um, are on a national level. The same thing is also true now on a European level. That uh, take okay, take for example the challenge now with Russia. Whichever side you take on this issue, whatever you think we should do next, whatever you think our chances of success are, whatever, whatever any of these things are, um, it is clear that it is not a Italian issue, or a Bulgarian issue, or a German issue. Mm. It's a European issue, and it's something that um, not only because of the EU, but you know, you talk about organic or not. Well, everything is in a sense organic, in the sense that our need for unity and the force for unity 
has been driven by very organic, real things. You know, it's a, it's an organic response to two world wars and a cold war and a wall. And it's not exactly, um, it didn't come out of nowhere. But of course, the, the vision for what should be, what that response should look like has been driven forward by a very small group of people. And this is part of the reason why I'm no longer what I would, you know, I used to be a very strong EU supporter in, the, in my young days. And then I had my period of doubt. Now I would say I'm, I'm rather skeptical of the EU, but I'm not against the EU. Um, no, I have the same, but it, I think that's a good point to make, right? It's about how it's done right now, yeah. not the concept of. Absolutely. Right? I, I think that's a, a good distinction. To and make. there, but maybe yeah, it's, it's I, worth I, mentioning I that, remember, I, I used to be an advisor to the president of the European Commission. So this is sort of the heart, in a way, of my um, professional career outside of Bitcoin. Mm. And... Uh, when I came in there, I was a very blue-eyed, optimistic, uh, European future kind of youth. And when I left there, I had seen a lot of things that made me very disillusioned with this way of seeing European unity. Yeah. So I, I yeah. definitely share your uh, your sense that this is a very forceful, top-down, um, inorganic, as you say, way of creating unity. Um, but I still think that outside of that world, outside that bubble, there is a reality of European unity that has not been captured, not been channeled. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I would agree to that. <laughs> mm. And so, obviously, you mentioned Bitcoin, but uh, and we're going to dive into it. But first, I wanted to ask you, like, what? Okay, blue-eyed <laughs> pro-EU guy. How did you find Bitcoin? And and yeah, like, how did how did you find it? How did it change your mind? <laughs> I think since I first discovered philosophy and um, and the, the notion that it's possible to think deeply about things, the number one thing I've been concerned about has been the notion of what is true. And every time I found something that was true, I would found some. I would discover soon enough that it wasn't true enough, and there was something truer underneath. So it became this rabbit hole that you just kept digging into. And then when I sort of came into an age where power was possible, you could join political organizations and all these kind of things, then the question of what is true really started aligning with the notion of who is in charge. And so I started searching the power of the world in a way. Where, where, is, where does power really reside and how can I find it? Trying to understand every system, trying to understand um, every dynamic out there. Um, and in that confused period, I think I, like many other people, uh, many other young people, was filled with an idealism that there there would be um, a, there, there would be a truthful system out there if we just implemented policy correctly. And until I reached the, uh, the European Commission, until I reached the, my working in Brussels, I think that was those were ideals that I still held on to. But I had begun dabbling in Austrian economics a few years before coming to Brussels. There was one video in particular. It's worth mentioning, actually, because it's, it's something that I think still to this day, it's a video that, that holds up and that you can still use to this day. But in 2008, after the financial crisis, there was a small group of artists that created a video called Keynes versus Hayek. Uh, nice. and, and this Keynes versus Hayek video... Uh, for someone who doesn't understand economics, when you look at it, it looks like a very balanced video. Like they, it's not clear who wins, you know, uh, in this in this discussion between Hayek and, and Keynes. But the more you think about it, the more obvious it becomes that Hayek is the winner. And anyone who knows anything about economics looks at this video and goes, my God, Hayek just destroyed Keynes. So that led to a second video, round two. And that round two video is a, is a detailed, like line by line, it goes through... Uh, different presuppositions of both sides. And this had really undermined my, my Keynesian thinking, if you want. I come from Norway. It's a very government-heavy Keynesian country. Um, my entire education had been based on, on every presupposition that Keynesians hold on to. Um, and so for me, that was a really like shaking moment that in this video, there were, no matter how much I could, I refuted any point that was said, it was so clear that Hayek had absolutely dismantled every intellectual foundation that, that Keynes was standing on. And I could not find any way to defend it. Like my mind originally was like, no, this higher guy must be nuts. Uh, he's missing something. And the more I thought about it, the less I found I was missing. So yeah. that was already you planted as a steed in my head right. before I came to Brussels. Yeah. And then when I came to Brussels and I was exposed to the Greek debt renegotiations, to the European migrant crisis, to the first, first invasion of Ukraine, 
in 2014 and how we handled these things. Um, there were several moments of, of disillusionment, but all of these things really made me think that, okay, um, we, we need a, a different system. And then I came across Bitcoin, like many people around 2013, and I read the white paper first. That was the first thing I ever read about Bitcoin. And Good start. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and maybe it makes me sound arrogant, but I have to say, I think almost, almost all of the things that I still understand about Bitcoin, I understood in that first read. Like I read it and uh, all the basics of what is still the structure of my understanding of Bitcoin fell into place almost immediately. But I um, happened to be working at the time with some of the world's leading economists, people who had been designing the banking union and all this stuff, you know? So they were very renowned. And I thought, hey, this is great. I work with some of the smartest people in the world. I should talk to them about it. So I, I took these ideas from the white paper and came to them. And there was especially one word I had never really heard before, but that kept being smacked in my head. And that was, we need elasticity. We need elasticity, elasticity, elasticity. What is elasticity? It's a notion that since the economy is not a static thing, you need, the government needs the ability to contract or expand the monetary supply in order to either have a counter cyclical or pro cyclical policy, right? And so you need elasticity, flexibility in the monetary supply. And um, the question why came up, obviously. And I was explained that, you know, this is necessary for growth. It's necessary that you don't get sticky prices and wages and all these kind of things that you normally hear from, from Keynesian economists. And none of these arguments that they, they were so confident in the way they were presenting them, but none of them really impressed me in the same way that the white paper had done. And, mm, and, nice. and so I was, that really made me start questioning, you know, how, how smart are these people? How, how much do they really know? Am I just an idiot for thinking that this, that a non-elastic monetary supply is better, uh, that it would lead to better results? But, you know, these were more smarter than me and I did have a lot of respect for them. So I dismissed Bitcoin as a result of this for a little bit, for a year or two. Can and I then ask it, something about that? Right. Like the, it's, it's funny, right? And, and we'll also talk about this more, but the fact that you found something on your own, you read it, you were like, whoa. And then you ask it to people who you have a certain perception of and, and, and they dismiss it. Yeah. And therefore you dismiss it. Yes. At least I mean, for a moment, right? Yes, but for what, a moment. What for a what, but wait, what happens there? What, what, is, what is that belief? Well, Why? That is, I suppose in a sense, it's a bit of intellectual humility. Like I, I uh, really did look very much up to these people and they occupy positions that I hope to occupy sometime in the future. And uh, everyone else seemed to be looking to them for answers. Uh, yeah. I didn't have any educational education in economics. I'd never taken an economics course in my life. So uh, to hear Sean Pisani Ferry and these kind of people tell you with such certainty that this is flawed for this, this reason. Um, but yeah, I did, but I did sit, sit and hum about it in my in back of my head. And I, after about a year, I had found that I didn't find any of these reasons particularly con convincing, but maybe there were other reasons why Bitcoin was a mistake. Maybe yeah. the government would ban it, for example. Uh, maybe it, it had some kind of technical flaw that would cause it to collapse or be hacked. Um, maybe Satoshi was still around and could crash the market. There were all kinds of like reasons why Bitcoin should and could fail. Yeah. And so, um, it took me a two, three, four years to reflect on each of these. Like, why can the experts be wrong? Yes, obviously. Today it seems like it was banal to say it, you know. But as a, yeah. this was a much, this was a different time, my friend. <laughs> People had yeah. more <laughs> trust in experts at the time as well. This was before went social quick, media. Though. Went quick. It went quick. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that that one disappeared. Can the government ban this? Uh, can the government stop it? I guess more broadly. Um, and I think around 2015, I came to the realization that it's beyond stopping. Um, so now it's down to, does it have some kind of inherent flaw that I missed? Yeah. Yeah. And that is sort of where it still is at, where the only thing that could be that I have missed is that it could have some inherent flaw that nobody has thought of. But my, the, the probability of that is never zero, right? Um, but for every single day that goes by, every block that is mined, every person that contributes to the, uh, to core on GitHub, for every person in this vast network of, of brains and, and human behavior, um, my 
confidence level that there is no such inherent flaw that has been missed by anybody, of course, yeah. grows. And at this point, uh, by 2016, I already felt very confident. You can imagine how I feel in 2024. We have had eight more years of, of this strengthening of, of confidence in the lack of an inherent flaw. So yeah, that, that I think 2016, 2017 was when I was like, okay, we got to go for this. This is, I started even calling it inevitable almost at the time, but I was still thinking, I was still one more flaw in my thinking. I think you can recognize yourself and many others here. Um, what if Bitcoin is just version 1.0? <laughs> <laughs> what if Bitcoin is just the beginning? Uh, so uh, yeah, for about well, a year now you or know so. That that is the entire point, right? Yeah. Well, now I know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But at the time, <laughs> of course, uh, um, I was unlucky enough to to meet Vitalik Buterin in 2015, and uh, it's a big diversion. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah, uh, this was uh, again before. Governments had really had a negative stance on Bitcoin in any way, or a stance at all. There was just a bit of like, they were humoring Bitcoin and they were entertained by it. And, um, and uh, this nerd wanted to come and talk about Ethereum, which was so, some alternative to Bitcoin. And he had, um, very enthusiastic about this, you know. So the Ethereum Foundation sent some people to Brussels to talk about, about Ethereum. And, uh, if I don't remember correctly, they made us install, um, some kind of, I didn't do it myself, but I remember there was some people who installed these, some app on their phone or on their laptops or whatever it was that allowed you to mine Ethereum directly in the wallet and stuff, you know? This wasn't part of Ethereum upon launch, but uh, as, as far as I think, but um, but this was very captivating. So so for, a, for about a year there, I was like many others, okay, so maybe Ethereum is the Bitcoin killer. And uh, then of course, uh, what about all these other coins? I started seeing utility tokens everywhere and having worked in government, honestly, you see so many moments where you think, wow, we should really have this budget on a public blockchain. Or, you know, wow, this identity thing would be solved so much better if you had some kind of secure system that everybody could access yeah. openly and control their own information, you know? So there was a lot of I have like, a confession. I have yeah. a confession. Yeah. Yeah. I now that you're saying this, I felt I think like I've never mentioned this before on the podcast, but I actually did a Litecoin presentation at the bank that I worked at. See, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And there was another guy who did the Bitcoin presentation and I was already into Bitcoin, but I thought Litecoin was it. Yeah. Oh, damn. You made me think of that. Shameful. It, and it's funny, you know, and there was even, I think, a time where, because it sounds so, it sounds so extremist to insist that Bitcoin is the only thing. And so for a long time, I almost, even though long after I probably myself understood that Bitcoin was the only thing. I couldn't quite bring myself to admit that in public, almost like I didn't want to be seen as a person who didn't have an open mind and who didn't, uh, right? And then you only realize well, it's that- actually, It's actually, you come to the conclusion that it's the only thing because you look at, you also look at everything else, right? So it's actually, yeah. it's the result of your open mind. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I, I, I would agree to the extremism part, like, yeah, this is just it and you should shut up. But like, this is just it because everything else is flawed. And I literally looked at it, right? Like, you know, you don't say that. Yeah. 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 But that, that definitely made me cautious about going out and being sort of a Bitcoin maximalist, even after I became a Bitcoin maximalist. And when I started my podcast for the first half year, I didn't intend to start a podcast. I started a podcast by accident. Uh, it became the biggest Bitcoin podcast in, in Scandinavia. Uh, it's in Norwegian. So none of your listeners will have heard of it or heard it. Uh, but um, when I started it, I uh, still considered, I was already a Bitcoin maxi, but I considered myself a Bitcoin maxi in private. And I didn't have any, I didn't see the problem with people dabbling in shit coins. I didn't see it like people could do whatever they want. And for me, that was part of the free market. And, and I realized early, once the podcasting sort of took off a bit, that, you know, having charts and talking about some other coins and stuff, they drew a lot of audience. And I had a lot, like I had hundreds of signups on my Patreon from people who just wanted to see the chart every day, you know? And then I came to this realization that this is not a question of what works commercially or what I can make money off. It's an ethical question. Knowing what I know, can I take responsibility for the consequences of legitimizing something so harmful. Can I take moral responsibility for legitimizing something so harmful? Yeah. To, uh, and I couldn't. So um, then I had to cut out every part of what we now would call shitcoinery from my podcast, cleansed it, 
change the name of the podcast from crypto for breakfast to Bitcoin for breakfast, every little detail like this. And it lost me nine tenths of my income. Wow. Like uh, almost all. And um, I don't think financially I haven't recovered to this day from making that change, but it's not a change I've ever looked back at and thought a second about because once I really think this is, um, uh, I think you asked me once about, you know, the, the, um, the moral or philosophical implications of Bitcoin in a way. And I think this is one of them. Like we have here yeah. technology for approximating truth. It's um, exactly uh, yes. it's it's uh, imp morally imperative upon each user to emulate that. And yeah, yeah. Well, I think this. I wanted to ask you, like, what what was what made you really see it, right? But what you just said about the approximation of truth, I I think for me that's one of the really big uh, key things, right? And so yeah. I, I translate that as like. For some people, this sounds weird, but it doesn't really matter. But like Bitcoin is engineered truth, right? It's just a protocol with the ledger. And every 10 minutes, we see that the ledger is still accepted by the majority of the people yeah. employing the protocol, right? And so that is the truth. That is the base layer truth for that system, right? And that right, gets... for that system. And this is like exactly. now, now I would actually like to like extend an invitation to, to go a bit deep here. Um, because here... We... We can talk about relativity. Um, we, all, we have known for 100 years that time doesn't objectively exist, that each particle experiences time separately. Uh, and therefore, you can have these funny effects of time moving slower and faster, depending on how high up you are and so on, right? Uh, yeah. And in reality, there is no unified... Yeah, you're, you're taking a real exit, but I love it. Okay, let's go. <laughs> uh, yeah. there, there is, no, there is no, no agreement in the universe about what time it is. Uh, now. Time, yeah. time is completely different from every, well, not completely different, uh, but it is different for every single little mm. particle, uh, every single little quark, and uh, by, 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 by more or less. So what do you do when you need a system to um, agree on something across time? Uh, is that you have to find some way to reach consensus about it. And that's what Bitcoin does. It's a machine to reach consensus about mm. what order things happened in time. Mm. Because all humans yes. are experiencing time slightly differently. Uh, we yeah. are all uh, experiencing truth slightly differently. So that's what I mean by it being an approximation of truth. It creates a um, uh, 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 the opposite of organic, a synthetic. It creates a synthetic truth that we can all choose to relate to. Uh, as a but, reference, yes. Yes. Um, and in the same way as like, you'd, you'd, I suppose, you know, particles don't have to respect the, the, the laws of time, but if they don't, they're not in this universe. <laughs> they, they need to, to be part of the system. And, yeah. um, and the same thing for, for users. If you want to be a part of the Bitcoin system, you have to, the only thing required is really just to follow the laws of the, of the protocol. Yeah. Um, and through that, it, it uh, generates an approximation of truth, a synthetic truth. Yeah. That was just a thought that I had while we were sitting here. I felt like it was worth just speaking No, I, 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 lo I love it. So I think, I think approximation of truth, I would say, is what we do on top of the, the base layered, which I would say is the engineered truth, yeah. right? Because yeah. the, you know, the, the Bitcoin doesn't care. A meme that's that right it's just chugging along and the numbers and the letters go left and right and they're in a different place and every 10 minutes you know uh we have like nineteen thousand nodes that say okay that's that's good please continue mm. right mm. and i think everything we do so that is the base layer of the of the truth because it doesn't care about what what we think of it but then everything we do on top whatever we build whatever we adhere to right or however we change our values or commitment to this or whatever right that is what i would then classify as the approximation of that right like your this is your baseline kind of thing like uh, what did i just say representation no i said uh well i don't not, know what i said but I just, yeah I'm, like that kind of like that i'm just uh, popping up a different way to think about it here that uh, you could also say that bitcoin makes truth irrelevant um, because uh, what Bitcoin proves, in a sense, is that it does not matter whether you sent the money first or I sent the money first. What matters is that everyone agrees. 
Mm. It's consent. It's cons mm. Yeah, well, it happened. If everyone agrees it happened, even if it didn't happen. Truth is, not, exactly. yeah. truth is not the important thing. Consensus is the important thing. So as long as everybody agrees what the truth is, that is the manifested truth, even if it never happened. Okay, we two things. Yeah. Is, it, is that like, if we go to the GG angle of Bitcoin is time, it's a, then, the, then it's like the now consensus. It's now, right? If I talk to someone in a different time zone in America, it's still the now. Right, we have that well, yeah, that's of... that's consensus about time. I'm thinking more about truth about of, about the order of, of yeah, events. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's the truth. That's that's one of the, the time is one of the truths that yeah. we use to yeah. operate in the physical world, right? Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. kind of like uh, an illustration to that. But yeah, I think the consensus part, even if we don't, what did you say? Even if it, even if it, it, whether it's true, whether it happened is not relevant. All that matters is that we all agree that it happened. If there is consensus that something happened, mm -hmm. then it will manifestly be so in the future, regardless of whether it ever happened or not. So <laughs> truth yes. becomes irrelevant because of Bitcoin, in a sense. Uh, it becomes post-truth, but not in the political sense of like truth doesn't matter and uh, we can lie about whatever. But in the sense that uh, well, truth is less interesting. Truth is less interesting than uh, that we all agree on what the truth is. If we all agree that you sent me money. Mm. Then, then there's consensus, and whether you send me the money is not really relevant. The money is now mine because everyone agrees it's mine. I'm almost there. I think. <laughs> whether you okay. sent me the money, if if yes. I today manage to convince the whole Bitcoin network that you yeah. sent me money, yeah, then it doesn't matter whether you did. The Bitcoin network will mine a block that says the transaction took place if there is consensus among all the miners that this happened. And therefore, the truth of the fact, of course, we know that there are mechanisms to ensure that this did happen. You know, we have to sign your yeah, transaction that's, that's and so what on. I, that's yeah, yeah. what messes with my mind. I mean, the point is that in Bitcoin, it does happen, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in Bitcoin, you, it's very it does happen, of course. Uh, and uh, but, but my philosophical point here is that it does not really matter. The, what matters is whether there is consensus mm. about what happened. The consensus becomes think, the truth. Because that's the yes, thing that we all exactly. relate to when we act into yeah. the future. Exactly. So... It's funny, I have to think of voluntary forced truth. I don't know. Like you 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 like choose I, I also say like you choose to follow the rules of the system because everyone else follows the rules of the system. Yeah, I mean in terms of like why like you that's, would that's, why your... you, that's in here in terms of why you accept the consensus, it becomes the fact that you want the benefit for of the of the network, right? Um let, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I mean. Like the fact that we uh, we adhere to these rules because everyone adheres to the rules that yeah. makes the opinion on them it's irrelevant because you already voluntarily chose to follow the rules. Yeah. But when you voluntarily Fuck, I hate these rules, to follow the rules, but it's not like you have to. You can go and use fiat any day. Nobody forces you to follow no, these rules. No, but it's like when you accept the rules, you follow the rules. So that's why yeah. I said voluntarily yeah. forced a consensus mm. right so mm. you choose to follow this consensus yeah it's funny i love it i, I love i love thinking about it like yes. but it's i think that's also why it's so difficult right like why it's so difficult to understand i think like i love your background by the way like if you if you like walk around in in you know i mean like what i said when i did the presentation at the bank like i walked around at a huge tradfi organization right there's hierarchy there's there's people that have certain certain power or, or or act like they have power, right? I think like you you've walked around in a similar yes. uh, environment, right? And so it shapes when sh when you're new in something like that. It sh also shapes how you act there, right? Like because you respect the hierarchy or you respect yeah, the yeah. projection of power or whatever, right? So in some sense, you are like there, but you also kind of like. At least for me, like you don't always think for yourself, right? You kind of follow how it how it works, right? And I, I think... have I have some very expensive suits in my closet. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> that, that hang there as a shameful reminder of how quickly you can 
waste yes. so much resources trying to fit in and emulate the others and try to, yeah. you know, in this uh, moment, it's like, God, I bought all these suits in order to be like the coolest bureaucrat or like to be the, and oh and my the God. The entire point I'm, of a suit is, is the unity, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's supposed to be Funny. a uniform. No, but that, but the fact that, you know, you, you whatever you do to, to sort of fit in, you do nothing for yourself. You follow the other thing. Exactly. And, yeah, and it's yeah, also yeah, a great yeah. example of the different mindset between Bitcoin and um, the world, the institutional world that I came from, because it's yeah. like in in um, in Bitcoin, the idea of spending an unnecessarily large sum on a piece of clothing you're going to wear every now and then is absurd, because you could spend that money on Bitcoin and you would <laughs> and you would be able to buy nineteen thousand suits in a few years, yeah. you know. So um, yeah. I think moving on further on this philosophical Bitcoin angle here. That that is a is a interesting way that Bitcoin fundamentally alters human behavior, uh, and this comes back to low time preference and concepts that I'm sure you've covered deeply yeah. in the podcast before. But yeah. this is yeah, this is where I wanted to go. Like the fact that you know why is Bitcoin so hard to understand? I mean, and and I, I repeated this a lot. Like there's enough factual uh, resources people can consume to learn how this works, yeah. right? And yeah. and so. You know, I, I, I say it's not an IQ test, right? It's, uh, I mean, it's hard to understand, but, you know, if you study, I, I don't know, like if you're motivated and you study, you can learn it. But it's it's more this personal ego battle that is like the greatest obstacle to understanding and like really adopting it, right? I mean, like your illustration of, yeah, I'm walking the, around there and then I'm going to buy a better suit because then what? Like my blue is better than the other guy's blue. Like what the fuck? <laughs> you know? But like, what's your view on this? Like the ego Ego no, uh, absolutely. I, I often say um, uh, Bitcoin will eventually kill more egos than acid. <laughs> uh, and and uh, <laughs> there's really, you know, I don't know if you've ever taken psychedelics, but if you um, if you have, you will, if you've taken a large amount of them, you will eventually come to that point where you're going to have to question um, uh, where if you don't accept that you don't understand what's going on, you're going to have a really exactly. bad time. Yes. <laughs> you know, if you sit there and yes. you insist that you know better than what yes. is being shown to you right now, you're yes. going to have a really bad trip. And yes. that's um, uh, I sort of this what... perpetual anxiety. Yeah, yeah, perpetual anxiety. And that's what you often see. Yeah. I've, I've, I've trip sitted many people in my life, introduced many people to psychedelics. And the most um, recurring theme I see is that people who have a very set understanding of how they think the world works or how they think the world is are the most susceptible to having a really bad trip. Because yes. being presented with reality and how it cannot, under any circumstance, be, um, uh, it does not in any way fit with the way that you see the world right now. They cannot be, uh, what do you call them, uh, reconciled. You mm -hmm. cannot reconcile the way that you think the world is with the way that the world obviously is in front of your eyes. Yeah. And this causes yeah. a mental meltdown yeah. and this yeah. is uh, going down to, 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 to Bitcoin as well. You know, um, if you, uh, are presented with Bitcoin and you see, you can understand all of these basic things about uh, uh, true technology and number go up and whatnot. But there are a couple of stages of humbling your own ego in order to fully yes. take advantage of yes. it. Yes. Uh, yes. The first stage is to, to, to understand that there may be other people who understand more than you. <laughs> that is like a simple basic thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come out young and arrogant and think they're the smartest people in the world and realizing that, wow, there's, there's real intelligence out there for me to grasp. Second one is that uh, you can't outsmart Bitcoin. Um, you know, you, you uh, come into this and you think, oh, I'm late to Bitcoin. But no worries, I am going to use my super high IQ to find uh, <laughs> Shiba Coin 3000 and <laughs> make all the Bitcoin that I didn't make. And then I'm going to sit yeah. on that, I pinky swear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, what happens is, of course, that first of all, you're not that smart. Uh, and you're certainly not smarter than Bitcoin. So you end up losing, if you don't end up losing all your money trying to invest in something else to outsmart Bitcoin, um, you will continue to try until you lose your money. Or uh, you will uh, make some money and think that you're even smarter and then you will waste all of that on something. The, 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 you're, it's really a, a trap if you don't allow your ego to, to put, be put to the side. So accepting yeah. that like, I can't outsmart this, I can't stop this, um, uh, I am not so smart that I have seen something, some flaw in this that nobody else has seen, 
all of these moments of of humbling yourself is necessary in order yeah. to to fully sit there with your coins on your wallet yeah yeah I, I think why this happens and and then I think if we take two steps back and as you just explained it like they're they're reconciling and I don't know if it's the mushroom drops talking right now but how I see it is like the confinement that that people put themselves in naturally right if you hold on to that too strong how how can you reconcile with the fact that you know the universe is infinite right like the, i think that is basically what happens right the fact that it's kind of like if your little cage however big you made it breaks open into the infinite holy fuck like that is scary reality right reality just isn't that real and that is yeah. the thing that really <laughs> if mm -hmm. you have a very strong sense of what you think is real you're gonna have a bad time yeah exactly but that is what you created of your percept you made your perception of it the consensus for everyone right yep. or your yep. consensus forever if we keep talking in that terms right and i think mm. like that is what the i would say i don't know if that's ego death necessarily but more the part of once you accept you know what i said about perpetual anxiety i said on the high hash rate podcast like it's the easy choice hard life hard choices easy life right it's the holy fuck okay the inf the, the the universe is infinite like how am I, am i going to reconcile with that like can i can i do that right oh no that sounds very scary i'm not gonna do this right that's the easy choice the hard life is the perpetual anxiety knowing that something else is true than what you integrated, right? And the hard, the hard choice is accepting this infinite, nobody's coming mm -hmm. to save you, I'm all alone, random here, like all these things, right? And that actually opens up your mind. Because I that's am coming the... to save me. Yes, exactly. But this is the hardest thing to uh, uh, mm. in integrate, I would say. The, just that, that fact that... I, I, yeah, I, just, I, just I haven't this used this term before, but I want to try it. Um, I have been thinking about a notion of something called having a depth to truth, that it's not for free to distance yourself from real, from real reality or distance yourself from truth. And the further the distance between the, your constructed reality, you know, humanity has the ability actually to live a little bit outside reality, to create imaginary worlds. That's what our nations are, you know? They don't exist yeah. in reality. There's no such thing as a nation in nature. They're entirely figure figments of our imagination that we share to the point where they become real. So we have an ability to, to, to uh, have a certain depth to truth. Um, and sometimes that can be beneficial. It allows us more flexibility perhaps than strictly adhering to the laws of nature. Um, but it does mean that sometimes when we, when we stretch that, uh, that, that room for imagination too far, and when t things come to call in a sense, it's like a rubber band. It smacks back harder the more you mm -hmm. distance yourself in the first place. And if you have created, you know, uh, once again, going back to my psychedelic obs observations here, um, one particular group, and I found this so fascinating, one particular group of people who really struggled with being introduced with psychedelics were um, uh, center leftists, people who typically voted for a labor party, specifically. And I, I thought a lot about what this, why this might be. But uh, I can't speak for every country, but in the countries that I have largely have drawn my people from, um, the Labour Party is typically the state carrying party. It's the, in many ways the most conservative party. It's the country party that's been in power the most uh, in the last hundred years. Uh, their notion of reality, they have had a long time to create an imaginary reality that's far removed from reality <laughs> yeah. and so and so their entire um world everything that they need to believe in is so constructed you know yeah exactly and, like and, their, their grip is so strong on that right but yeah. but reality is fucking stubborn man and and uh <laughs> yes. and that's what that's what happens when when you come to this moments of like discovering bitcoin or taking your first acid tab uh it comes like the more you've you've depended on such constructed realities to understand the world, the more it smacks you in the face, the more it hurts. Um, yeah. I f yeah, yeah. I, I, it's it's funny. So I think in a similar way, I just word it different. Like what I just what I just said, right? The fact that 
if you try to have a, a, a grip on it, as you said, right? Because losing the grip is so scary. Mm. The, it's the equal result, to death. Exactly. It's equal right? to death. Yeah, but the result of always enforcing that grip on that constructed reality, no matter what, is a way harder life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Than just accepting what it is, right? Like the accepting what it is 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 Bitcoin is Zen. Gives, it, yeah, but it gives you <laughs> that's what gives you the freedom. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and then because if you accept what it is, like the universe is everything or whatever, like whatever we make of it, basically, right? Then you're so free to move and explore and learn and just be curious without any um you're really bad, ne bad, like negative outcome for you're really close to the reality to stumbling onto why death is an illusion here you know it's uh, also another it. observation <laughs> that's been made by many who who venture down these paths and yeah. uh because fundamentally at the end of the day the universe as it's implied in the word uni was mm. single one oneness um universe is one and you are in it you are a part of it and anything that you are beyond the universe is a constructed reality. It yes. has absolutely no basis in reality whatsoever. It's entirely your imagination of a guy called Bram who lives in a fairy tale land called Netherlands. <laughs> like none of these things are real. Not even the name <laughs> they're, I picked. They're, you know? they're just symbols, you know? Yeah, that's and, true. And they are symbols that are so important to us uh, that we think that if they go away, we go away. We die. <laughs> but yeah but in some way so even your name like we are talking like this and i feel we are uh, less part of certain constructs than other people but still your name is still part of it some construct you can call me right? whatever you want but uh, eric has been eric has been a useful <laughs> symbol to too. Me. yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> no yeah. but i mean that's an illustration of just how useful mm. it's not like creating imaginary realities is always a bad thing like i pointed out uh, it's 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 key to 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 uh, humans to be able to live in imaginary realities. That's how we organize our societies and our stock and and everything. We need to believe that these things exist, even if they don't. So it's it's not a bad thing necessarily to have imagination. What's a bad thing is if your imagination starts ignoring the realities on the ground. So um, yeah. You know, like... Or just na nature in general, or the universe in general, right? Like if you if you think that your construct is the construct, and that's what yes. you need to uh, defend, etc. Right? Like I I mean that in general, I, I I see that a lot. It's like we can think ourselves out of nature or beyond nature. Yes, yes, yes. The with, with the right, right? Like that with the the right policies. Exactly. With the right policies, <laughs> humans would move beyond their normal yeah. behavior. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, exactly. and this is, this is yeah. of course, psychopathic uh, genocidal thinking. It leads only to one thing. Once you start thinking that we can create the new man, we just need to perfect him a little bit and get rid of yeah, the dirty elements. That's a dangerous elements. line to walk. I agree. Yeah. No, but this is, this is it, right? I, um, I, I think you don't hear me, but I'm just going to keep, keep talking. Um, Back. And I think Almost we're back. back. Yeah, I hear you. yeah, we're thinking. Okay, I'm gonna mark it. I'm gonna record. The, hey, listen. The, um, yeah, I'm getting a warning on my recording device here that okay. we're coming to the end of this podcast. Why? Because the uh, pod because I have three percent on your headphones. Okay, uh, on my on the, rec the recording device itself. I'm using the phone. Ah, okay, gotcha. So. so Three minutes, Eric Dill. <laughs> this has been a great chat. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm mentioning yeah. it now because I don't want it to be just a sudden interruption. And there's nothing I can do about it, sadly. Um, That's fine. Little, we, you and I uh, have, have been plagued with many unforeseen circumstances. And that doesn't stop <laughs> today. But that, for no. me, is just a great reason why we need to continue this conversation soon. 100%. Let's definitely do that. I love uh, jamming like this. I think this is what eventually bitcoin invites you to right like this the questioning of constructs and opening your mind and just exploring right i mean like also for the people listening like please don't believe anything we no say. no half the thoughts i said today i had for the first time while we were chatting really? i am yeah, st as great. surprised as you are by what comes out of my mouth love it yeah well <laughs> same 
But I think, uh, and I said this before on another podcast, like the action is the inspiration, right? I think it, this, uh, like talks like this are like an invitation for ourselves to do it more. So we're definitely going to do that. But like also to other people to be like, hmm, okay, maybe I just go down this path sometimes, right? And see what it brings to me. And I think for me specifically has brought me immense freedom in my mind and and more clarity and so yeah for, for me it's been only beneficial and I, I i think it's probably the same for you so um, absolutely i mean I've, yeah. i I'm, I'm changing the title of my speech in prague but my original title was saved by bitcoin lsd and parenthood uh <laughs> and and i yeah. think that is a, a good example of just how much bitcoin has i, I equal i equal that to the importance of parenthood and and, and psychedelics Love that. Love that, man. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I will link to all of your links and all the stuff in the description so people can follow you. And we're going to do this soon again, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, this will be part one. Yes. And then uh, (laughs) the exploration to we don't know where. The Dale series. That's what what I'm expecting now. Let's do that. Thank you, Bram. Cheers. Thank you for the invitation. Ciao. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.